I'm Dr. Peter O'Donnell, and the article that we're presenting today is Evidence for Clinical Implementation of Pharmacogenomics in Cardiac Drugs. I'm Dr. Matthew Sorrentino. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago in the section of cardiology. All right, in this research, we were interested in studying why there are adverse drug reactions for patients who get commonly prescribed cardiovascular drugs. And there's certainly been much research in the area of pharmacogenomics to try to explain patients' risk for adverse drug reactions or for non-response to those medications. We know that there's been much evidence in many studies around many drugs, and we were unsure why some of these drugs hadn't been routinely implemented in clinical practice. And so we wanted to rigorously assess the quantity and quality of evidence for pharmacogenomics around cardiac medications for possible consideration in implementation projects. So uh, Dr. Sorrentino is a practicing cardiologist, and so we wanted to ask his perspectives on some of the data that we've presented on and on his experience in pharmacogenomics relevance to his practice. So Dr. Sorrentino, could you comment on the relevance of pharmacogenomics in cardiac practice and how you think it could potentially help your care of patients? I think before this study, I had very little knowledge of pharmacogenetics. We knew that some patients responded well to drugs, some patients did not, some patients had side effects from medications. What I think was very exciting about this study is we learned some reasons why that is the case. Um, some examples are the statin drugs. We know some patients have uh, muscle uh, pain with statin drugs. Uh, now we know there's a genetic tendency towards that which we can measure and it can help us decide uh, what would be the proper drug to choose for that uh, patient. Uh, in cardiology, it turns out that there is fairly robust uh, pharmacogenomic information on many of the drugs we use, and I think it was unclear before this study how that can impact patients and impact patient choices. So by using this information, I think we can individualize the patient care and choose medications that are less likely to cause side effects and hopefully have more of a clinical impact on the patient. At the University of Chicago, we've had access for a few years now to be able to test some of the genetic markers that we describe in this paper. Um, Dr. Sorrentino, have you had the opportunity to even utilize pharmacogenomic information uh, in your practice for any patient? Is there uh, an example that you could give? Uh, yes, we have a fair number of patients in this study, and there's two ways I've used the information. Uh, one way is a patient has a uh, side effect of a medication. We can look up the uh, genomics that are specific for that patient and find out that uh, they're on a medication that is more likely to have a side effect. And uh, the information then gives us alternative medications which should be just as effective, which don't have uh, the side effect profile, and we can uh, use uh, those. Um, Simvastatin is a good example um, that uh, uh, has a high likelihood of causing muscle aches if you have a particular genetic variant. Um, and if we know that, we can then choose the medications that are metabolized by a completely different um, metabolism system in the liver and avoid uh, the side effects. Um, I've even found information that uh, are not directly related to cardiac drugs but made a big difference in our patients. I had one patient who kept having chest pain, which sounded very much like uh, reflux disease. Um, he was on a medication uh, Prilosec for that, which wasn't seemed to be helping. We had genetic information on that, found out he was a poor responder to Prilosec, but a better responder to other agents, uh, switched to one of the other agents based on that information. All of his chest pain went away, uh, which turned out to be due to a heartburn or due to a GERD. Um, and without that information, wouldn't have realized that his chest pain was all due to non-responding to one of the medicines, and all the information was there in the pharmacogenetics. So one, one of the things that we try to show in this um, work is that there's actually been tens of thousands of patients already studied for many of these pharmacogenomic markers that have been discovered for cardiac drugs uh, in multiple studies, and, and many of these uh, examples, these drug uh, genetic variant uh, associations have been studied in, in numerous uh, positive publications. So I guess the question is, you know, why don't you think this information is more widely adopted among practicing cardiologists? I think part of the problem is there's no one place where all this information is available. Um, there's 
hundreds of studies uh, scattered throughout the literature. Uh, and without that information in one easy place to find it, uh, cardiologists aren't aware that this information is even available. Um, I think there still is ongoing work that needs to be done. Some of these studies are relatively small and uh, will need larger studies over longer periods of time to verify the impact of some of these changes. But I think most of it right now is we just need a central location where this information is available so that uh, education and learning can be done so cardiologists know that this information even exists. I think you're bringing up an interesting point that we try to make in the article, which is most cardiac drugs that we looked at have had a positive pharmacogenomic study published about them, but still the minority of drugs uh, really have evidence that rises to the point of, of warranting what we thought was uh, clinical uh, summary or, cl or clinical consideration. Um, one of the other questions that we had about this um, was if, if a cardiologist was trying to use this information for their given patient, um, really what is the evidence standard that might be necessary and does that change for different clinical situations? Well, the best evidence, of course, is randomized controlled uh, blinded trials, uh, which is going to be hard to find in this uh, area. Uh, that gives evidence that is certainly the most uh, robust. Uh, but I think if there is a strong correlation um, and if you have a patient that's clearly having a side effect that is described in these uh, papers, uh, we may not need to have that large of a, of a study. Uh, but certainly uh, outcomes and clear evidence of side effects is what's going to drive using this type of information. That was one of the factors that we used to, to rigorously assess the evidence for each one of these drug uh, variant pairs was, was looking at the type of study, the methodology in great detail, um, whether there was uh, con appropriate controls, whether there was appropriate statistical uh, correction for testing multiple genes at one time, and whether the, the clinical outcome uh, that was being measured was really measured in, in an appropriate um, and, and careful way. And these were all the hallmarks that we found for the, the drug variant pairs that rose to what we thought were the highest level. Uh, they had studies that showed all those same um, features for, for being high quality um, evidence. So one of the final points we wanted to make regarding uh, our work was that the, the true clinical utility of these findings on changing patient outcomes, avoiding adverse events, and improving response rates to these drugs will certainly have to be demonstrated by further research, further uh, likely prospective research showing that the uh, availability of pharmacogenomic information actually changes those clinical endpoints. And most of the studies that we reviewed uh, are, are not yet at that point, uh, but we thought that um, the purpose of assembling this type of information was really to highlight those that might be ready for stu such follow-on studies, that many of these drug variant pairs um, currently have been studied in thousands of patients, and um, now they should be considered for possible clinical implementation. Pharmacogenomic information has great potential of individualizing our care of patients in the, in the future. I think we will have uh, less likely to cause side effects in patients, more likely to have uh, better efficacy and better outcomes as more of this information becomes available, as the data gets reproduced in better trials, uh, this is going to be how the future of medicine is going to move forward to have our patients uh, better taken care of. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.